All right, we are going to get started. Uh, welcome, everyone. I know we'll have folks who are joining us during this half hour, um, but you are in the right place. You are here at the Project on Workforce uh, webinar series where we're today. We're going to be discussing uh, healthcare workforce solutions. Uh, my name is Chike Agu. Uh, I was formerly Chief Innovation Officer at the U.S. Department of Labor during the Biden administration, currently a senior advisor here at the Project on Workforce at Harvard University. And I want to thank the entire team for setting up this forum for us uh, to have this conversation. I'm really excited to be here and discuss this topic with my good friend and colleague, uh, Jeffrey Roach, who is the uh, North American uh, Director of, of Workforce Strategy for Siemens Health and Years. He has uh, seen this topic from many different angles and comes to it from a, from, from a, from a, 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 a topic of, of deep mission, from an area of deep mission, as well as also from commercial success. Uh, and this topic of healthcare workforce solutions uh, is really, really critical. If we step back and, you know, I think about my time in industry, I spent a lot of time in the technology industry, spent a lot of time in, in advanced manufacturing, even during my time in government. But not really till I got into government did I understand the the the, the healthcare workforce crunch that we are in as a country. And uh, this is critical, uh, not only because obviously uh, any, any job unfilled is a missed opportunity for an American worker, but particularly in the healthcare space. And when we don't have these jobs filled, the, 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 these are patients who are not getting the care that they need. This means that communities are not as healthy. And also, healthcare is almost one fifth of American GDP. So if we don't get this sector moving, this is an economic drag on the entire country. So I'm really excited to talk about this topic. And um, what we're going to do is have a, a, a kind of quick a uh, half hour, but in-depth conversation about this topic. I'll throw some questions. Uh, Jeffrey will answer, and, we'll, and we're going to go kind of where the conversation takes us. But Jeffrey, what, here's what I want you to do, and, and really welcome, and thank you for being here. The first question I have is just give us the state of play. Talk about where the healthcare workforce in America is, um, and also define it for us. I think when most of us think of healthcare, we think of doctors and nurses, but it's much bigger than that. So give us the state of play and make sure that we're, we're framing what the healthcare workforce is in the right, most expansive way. Yeah, well, Chike, thank you, and and obviously thank you to the to the team here at the at the Project on Workforce at Harvard for this opportunity. You know, really, as so many of us know, the reality of it is is that our healthcare workforce globally is and and here particularly in the United States is at one of the one of the most challenging times in history. We we have to acknowledge we know uh, the facts of burnout. Uh, we know the the nursing crisis uh, that we've all been paying attention to, but but to your point. You know, we're getting data all the time that also speaks to the fact that we have a significant shortage, uh, you know, and also physicians. Uh, we have a lot of physicians, nurses, and all members of the care team that are preparing to retire. We don't have enough coming out of our colleges and universities because ultimately they they're, they also are, are kind of stuck with the number of students that they can from accreditors and, and such. We also have obviously uh, significant faculty shortages at our institutions. And so we've got that challenge as well, which also has a huge challenge on the supply and demand. But to your point, holistically, we have to acknowledge that we need everybody. Uh, when you think about allied health, you think about imaging, you think about lab, uh, you think about services like oncology. The reality of it is, is to your point, we're talking about access to care. And we're also talking about care that has to be delivered and diagnoses and treatment that has to happen. And so we really are at a very challenging time. Uh, 2027 is coming very soon. That's the, the date that we've all been paying attention to for quite some time that suggests that we're going to lose, you know, a significant amount uh, of the workforce. Uh, some suggest 50 to 60 percent. You know, we'll, we will see what that looks like. Um, but I'll tell you this much. In imaging alone, we've lost 30 percent post-pandemic. And so if you think about that alone on top of everything else, we've got a significant challenge. So. These are big numbers and big stats. When we think, when, again, when I think about the healthcare, healthcare and have potentially having fifty to six percent of, of folks about to retire, that 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 is a uh, uh, that's something that that will keep many people up at night. Let's get a little specific and let's kind of segment this workforce a bit. So let's talk about the clinical side. Let's talk about the folks in hospitals and care settings um, every day. But talk about that workforce and I'll, and really kind of question you know two A and two B. One, where is that workforce standing and really. Um, why is it hard? Why is this hard? I think that I, I think that's one thing that I think a lot of Americans don't understand, which is okay. We need more doctors. Let's just train more more doctors. Let's train more nurses. Um, this is a conversation that we've been having since I was a kid. But it, um, but talk about the, where it stands in terms of that clinical workforce, and also why is it so challenging? 
to fill that. Yeah. A lot of people who are not in healthcare don't get this. Yeah. So, you know, I think we have to sit back and, and recognize a couple of things, right? We have uh, certainly a system where, you know, licensure, accreditation, uh, very much highly regulated industry, by far one of the most highly regulated industries in the United States uh, is healthcare. We also have, you know, a challenge, uh, as we all know, around uh, the academic side, the number of uh, faculty to student ratios. We know we have to have uh, significant challenges as well there around clinical placements and clinical experiences. And then when you go to the hospital side, obviously, we also have to acknowledge that we have to get back to caring for one another. Retention is, is by far the biggest challenge we have in healthcare today. We are losing far too many members of the team in all roles just based on culture, just based on the organization that they serve. And we're at a very different time. We're at a crossroads where many people, millennials, Gen Z, uh, and even others are saying, you know what, I don't want to necessarily be tied to just one organization. I want to serve in healthcare, but I want to have the flexibility and opportunity to work at multiple healthcare organizations. That gig economy has become very real in healthcare. And so the obvious point there that we have to keep in mind, though, is what do we do to help people find joy and find connection in the workplace? We can't afford to lose anybody that serves in healthcare. We need them at every specific role. And so we have to get back to that from a priority perspective. We really have to have a very strategic approach to what we're doing to really lift up culture and support our professionals. You know, I think of uh, the stories that I hear, you know, there, there was a nurse, uh, nurse Tristan was her name, who was a nurse in Ohio. And ultimately, uh, Chike, she, her life ended because of the, of the stress, the burnout, and really the culture of the hospital she served in. Her story went public after her life ended because her parents found a letter to the editor that she wrote, that she requested to have it published after her life was, was no longer here. That, that letter specifically talked to burnout, culture, issues in the workplace that she was bringing up to leadership uh, that weren't dealt, and ultimately, uh, you know, she's no longer with us. Those stories are becoming far too real in healthcare. And so we've got to get back to humanity in all these aspects. At the same time, we do need to also address what I consider the academic challenges as well. And I'm a firm believer that we need to have our accreditors and our licensing boards uh, really come to the table with employers and really work through these aspects because we're still working off of a system that just is not necessarily in touch with where we sit today. So, so, so let's let's look at those 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 two sides of 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 the challenge. One, you've named flexibility a couple times in terms of flexibility on the the licensure and accreditation side. And what I hear is basically because the the, the requirements are not as flexible as they need to be, you're constricting the amount of people who can come into the profession. That's what I hear. Um, talk more about that. Uh, you know, if you could wave, if, if you and Seatman's could wave a magic wand, how would accreditation and licensure look different mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to deal with some of these challenges? And then let, I'll come to culture in a second, but talk about just that piece. Because it's something I've heard yeah. you talk about a lot. And I think it'll, again, it'll be helpful to, for folks to get a sense of, of, of where ideally you'd want the world to go. Yeah. So if you take just imaging, you know, historically, you know, imaging is a sector, think of our technologists, Think about the individuals that help uh, you as a patient to, you know, do x-rays, do MRIs, do, uh, you know, cardiac type of procedures, do ultrasounds, uh, et cetera. There's no one that ever is going to have an experience in healthcare in many cases that's not going to also come into contact with our amazing imaging professionals. But if you look at imaging, historically, it's a community college driven program associate's degree, two-year program. Yes, there are bachelor's programs as well. And under, under those programs alone, you know, consider the fact that our community colleges, uh, I'm the son of a community college graduate. I love our community colleges and they do transformative work throughout this country, but they also have limited resources. And depending on the state that they're in, it's even more limited. And so we have to be honest about the challenges that exist there. There are faculty student ratio challenges. Uh, our in the imaging profession, ARRT, uh, which is the licensing side of it, that both both uh, ARRT and JCERT, which is a higher ed accreditor, they require you know in-person 
clinical placement hours of over 1,400 hours, 100% uh, in person. They don't allow simulation. And so if you think about that, you think about it from the vantage point on, on two ends. One, equipment is very, very expensive. And so think about being a college that has to have this equipment. You've got to prepare your students, but then you have to help them find them that clinical placement. And they've got to do that 1,400 in-person clinical hours. They don't have the opportunity or flexibility to do, replace that with any virtual simulation. Whereas in nursing, nursing is allowed 30%. Some states even allow up to 50%. But that's also more recent. That happened in the last few years. But it's still a solution that has to happen in imaging as well. The other thing we have to do is we really have to invest in the faculty as a nation. Uh, when I speak with governors, I always talk about this as well. We have got to invest in our community college faculty. It is tough to recruit. It is tough to retain because ultimately the, in, their, in a healthcare professions, they can make a ton more money going and serving in healthcare than they will as faculty. But we need them as faculty, because they're building the next generation healthcare professional. But our colleges need help, and we really need, you know, the federal government and the state governments to really be paying attention to this and really helping. And, and then obviously industry has to do our part too in, the, in really a public-private partnership to help make that happen. So those are some of the examples. I'll tell you though, the reality of it is, is when we look across this uh, country, the work that our community colleges have done uh, really needs to be recognized. And and the way that I feel it can be recognized is if we further invest and support them uh, to really make it happen. That's how we're going to build a sustainable future-ready workforce. Uh, uh, that's really helpful. And I think as someone who sits, I'm, I'm, I'm vice chair of the Maryland Higher Ed Commission. I, I'm a big advocate of our community colleges because in some ways they're, they're, they are the workhorses of the higher ed system. And again, we ask a lot and at times we give a little in terms of what uh, of what we expect. When I hear you talk about these challenges, I mean, I could go to so many other professions. If, if I started my career as an educator, if you were to go to the teaching profession, very similar dynamics. You have, you have very much a U-shaped curve. A number of folks, 20 and 30, are going to retire. Um, uh, the challenges of, uh, of uh, placement, challenges of burnout, particularly post-pandemic, very similar dynamics. Um, and, and this, what you're talking about, which is how do we have different form factors you know, uh, uh, this is where healthcare is actually a little particular because you need those clinical placements. And and in theory, you understand why. You don't want someone walking in with mm -hmm. a patient the first time who's never actually seen a patient. That You you want to avoid that. But yep. because of the challenge of there has to be a hospital, there has to be a clinical placement for them to go to. There has to be the equipment for them to use, so on and so forth. That just creates a bottleneck because, yep. it's, it, 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 you know, the, these things don't fall off trucks to use the old uh, 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 phrase. And being able to use some of these different form factors, I think, uh, would make sense. On the faculty side, this is a this is a very very similar dynamic to so many other professions where you you want someone to teach someone else to do a thing, but they could actually make way more money doing that thing themselves. <laughs> and therefore, you know, you've seen some states. I'll use education as an example. Um, you see this with uh, STEM teachers. Hey, I, you mm -hmm. want someone to come teach chemistry? Well, if I know enough about chemistry to teach it, I could actually go work in industry and make a lot more money. How do you think about, for example? Uh, you know, rotational models, tours of duty, where people are on loan coming back. And I think getting um, more creative about what those form factors can look like is really, really critical. And again, in, in healthcare, we have we absolutely have to get this right. L let me move to the culture questions. This is actually not talked about enough. And this, is, I think, really came to the fore in the pandemic. I am, uh, 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 my, my mother has seven sisters. They're all nurses. Um, I am the uh, brother of a nurse who actually now is a, is a physician. I am married to a physician. Um, they went through a lot in the last four years. Talk about that, because I also because I also want to say, and I hear this in what you're saying, it wasn't just the pandemic. In many ways, the pandemic laid bare a bunch of cultural issues that we've always had in healthcare. They kind of came yeah. to the fore and were unavoidable. Just talk about that, because I don't we don't talk about this enough in, in the dialogue about why this is also part of the workforce challenge in the healthcare space. Well, let let's start by you know first to your point, acknowledging all of our healthcare professionals because the work that they do is very challenging and and they are truly doing it every day to care for others. But we have to acknowledge though, that while they're doing that, you have the organizational challenges potentially around culture. But the other piece I don't wanna not, not highlight, uh, and it's truly unfortunate, is we have more violence occurring in our healthcare systems than ever before. Wow. Patients hurting our caregivers, uh, at times staff hurting one another. Wow. In fact, I was just having this dialogue earlier today 
uh, with several executives from UC Health in Colorado and, and others this morning, uh, where they're just seeing this significant increase in, in this violence. You know, this is a space where people come to serve. And we've got to address these things, both, both as a society, but also as a, as also as a healthcare system. But to your point, culture is super important. What we absolutely know today by all aspects of employee engagement, and keep in mind in healthcare, employee engagement, high, uh, high performing employee engagement means high performing patient care. They're all correlated. So quality, patient engagement, employee engagement, all super connected. But what we know over the last several years is we really lost a significant amount of our workforce just on these issues alone. And so I always tell people in healthcare, as leaders, we have to think about it from the vantage point of we can have a make it or a break it moment every single day for our workforce. We have to be thinking about what we're gonna do to make their day be the best that it possibly can, or we're gonna continue to choose to break it for them. You know, this the concept of mattering in the workplace, the sense of belonging in the workplace is very, very real in healthcare. I always encourage people, if you haven't, to watch the Stanford uh, Medicine video, I Am Human. It's a very, very powerful video. And what you'll see when you watch that video is the true reality of healthcare. Like you, I'm the son of a nurse. I worked a decade in hospital. And uh, I would never, ever have traded that moment and that experience. Because what I saw were the best people taking care of people with passionate purpose, truly caring about other people. But what I also recognized in my time there and as I travel across the country is we have to have leaders that also care about them. We can't be effective in healthcare if we don't take care of ourselves, but we also have to have people that are going to help us to take care of ourselves. And so this is very, very real. And I think to your point, what it speaks to is really our society. You know, just like our society is challenged in a lot of ways with polarization and, and division, Unfortunately, that has happened in a, in a significant way in healthcare, where in many ways, in, in many organizations, people will feel there's kind of an us versus them you know, type of approach. If you look at nurses and you look at allied health, for example, for quite some time, they've been saying a lot of the issues that are also coming forward in many organizations, they've been bringing them up. They've been saying, "Let's we need to deal with this. We need to deal with this. And then it's not heard. And one of the things I regularly talk about in healthcare is boards of directors also have a duty and a fiduciary responsibility to care about these issues. Because ultimately the board's job is, is fiscal, strategic, and looking ahead to make sure the organization is sustainable. Well, you can't be sustainable if you don't have your workforce. And if you don't take the extra effort to care for them, you're certainly not gonna be sustainable. And so we really need to have boards, which are normally made up of, from the community, super engaged in these issues to hold the executive team and then for the executive team to, to work with the whole organization to really make sure they're doing all that they can in these issues. But culture is super, super important. This is so important. I'll, I'll use an analogy. You know, when I worked in, in industry, um, probably about, let's call it six, seven years ago, uh, the topic of cybersecurity uh, became a board level discussion in, 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 in every corporation. There would always be a section of the board meeting on cybersecurity because it's a make or break issue. You have a, you have the wrong breach. That's the end of your, of your business. You, I can name, I think we all can name companies where it's caused a huge issue for them. I would argue in many industries, you know, I can name some, some specific ones, but healthcare is one where this has to be a board level uh, discussion on a regular basis. How are we doing? Because literally, you know, if, if your product is care, yeah. Where the critical parts of the cost of goods sold of that is the uh, is the people, and if you don't, you know, if you if you make widgets and you don't have enough steel to make the widget, you can't make widgets. It's, it, it, I, and care is not a widget, but in turn, but that is the critical thing. And 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 the fact that we have this crunch it is 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 really critical. And and I know you've thought a lot about this, but but healthcare, like many organizations, does not think about someone's talent like a supply chain. Mm -hmm. In the sense of ideally, if you were to grab any company that manufactures things, they can tell you, I can tell you exactly how much of this metal I have in pipeline to make this product and when it's going to get here. But for talent, um, you see a variability in terms of how much people know, but even the people they have, one. Yep. And then secondly, where are the people who are going to replace those people coming from? How are we preparing them? So, you know, and these are things that, that you spend your days on. I want to move and you talked a little bit about this with imaging. So there's this, there are all these other parts of healthcare. There's these people in some ways don't see the patient, but who are critical to that patient's care. And imaging is a great example. 
Many people may never actually meet the person who, who looked at their image, so on and so forth, but that's a critical part of their care. My wife is a dermatologist, you know, she has, yeah. has done many biopsies during her, her uh, you know, her time, uh, just as one example. But can you talk about that side, all that other stuff that makes healthcare work and where the workforce stands there? Yeah. So one of the things in imaging and ASRT, which is our professional society, has done a phenomenal job. Uh, just this last year, rolled out a video called Be Seen. And, and the reason that's called Be Seen is that we have to really recognize and, and help everyone understand the critical role that technologists play in our care system. And so when you think about it, if you break a bone, um, if you, you know, if you're if you're pregnant, uh, you know, with ultrasounds, if you, you know, like me as a, a cardiac patient, I have to have many different scans done uh, because of, you know, because some of my cardiac issues, like all of us experience imaging. But to your point, we often think it's the radiologist. You know, we think it's the doctor. Yes, the radiologist does read the scans. Uh, and interprets and and provides uh, to the to the care team, the other doctors and such, what the right diagnosis and and uh, treatment protocols will be. But the reality of it is, it's the technologist who actually does your scan, and it's the technologist who, in many cases, is having that direct conversation with patients who could be afraid of what they're dealing with. And so, the other piece of imaging that most people don't realize is that is cancer care. And so, you know, for those that know the company Varian, Varian is a Siemens Health and Ears company as well, and. If you think about cancer, right, linear accelerators, you think about cancer moonshot, most people don't realize, you know, cancer care, uh, particularly in those areas, uh, radiation therapy is also a part of, of imaging. And the critical role that that plays as well, different, you know, obviously different degree, uh, generally a four-year degree. Um, but again, same, same situation there. Uh, we've had more and more programs close across the country in radiation therapy. Uh, we continue to have the challenges, as, as I said, on the imaging side. Um, and, and so, you know, from a workforce perspective, the same issues apply here, just like any other role. However, it is a major financial driver for the healthcare system. And so uh, what we have to do, and Siemens has done a phenomenal job in this space, uh, we've continued to support, you know, hospitals and health systems around upskilling, reskilling, uh, you know, really helping them. Yes, there's the technology side, but we always say you, you can have the technology, but you also have to have the people. And so we've been very intentional about supporting the people. Uh, so anytime we do any work with the hospital system, we're doing incredible work to support their workforce. We've developed leadership development programs that have helped hospital systems retain their employees, grow their employees, keep them in the system. And we've done this at scale. Uh, we've continued to also help all the professionals you know, thousands and thousands of these amazing professionals further define and grow their competency so that they can be the best technologist possible. But this work is super, super important because it's the only way that we can continue to enable exceptional patient care. But I do want to I do want to say, though, and, you know, I know this is something that you care deeply about and work you led, you know, at the Department of Labor, as well as that we've got to move our model in higher ed. You know, we've got to move it to a more work based learning approach. And the reality of it is, is that Healthcare is a space where we need to adopt in the United States apprenticeship degrees. It is paramount. In my opinion, when we look at the data, when we consider all the challenges of the system that we've talked about here and we continue to talk about in other, sp other spaces, this is a space where think about the clinical placement challenge that we just talked about. If you're a healthcare system and you could grow your future workforce through youth apprenticeships uh, and then put them into an apprenticeship degree, you will have an amazing opportunity to build your own and retain them because the data is absolutely clear. And we see this across the country with healthcare systems that have done this work. They're doing incredible work and they're retaining their workforce and they're growing them. We've got to get our accreditors and we certainly have to get others to, to really understand that it's, it's way past time to move into a model where we have apprenticeship degrees. And, and I, I definitely am you know, very encouraged by the work of Reach University and the National Center for the Apprenticeship Degree. We've got to move this uh, I can't speak more passionately about how important it is that we that we elevate this work and take the next steps on it, because when we look at healthcare, that faculty element is important to acknowledge too, right? We've got a faculty shortage, but if we can learn and earn on the job, we've got the faculty right there. We can continue to build a different approach. It works. Europe has tested this. We've all seen it. It's a phenomenal model. It works, and uh, you know I think it's it's really past time that we that we see it happen here. Look, and, and I think, first of all, thank you so much for, for giving that overview and particularly talking about the work of uh, you know, Reach University and NCAD and, and, and in terms of that those models. And, and, and one other thing I'll name is we see this a lot, which is 
apprenticeship is a powerful way to reach communities that you historically not uh, hired from. If you look at the data, generally folks are coming through, sometimes either work-based learning, but particularly registered apprenticeship, pipelines are more diverse, retention looks better. Um, now, not trivial to set this up. It is definitely, um, uh, it takes work, but it's kind of one of those things where you make this investment, but the long-term uh, benefits are are huge. And the one thing that I'll say that I'm encouraged by is when I think about the work I've done with health systems, nowhere nearly as extensive as yours, I am seeing healthcare systems um, ready to try anything because of because they they see this tsunami coming and they want to get and they want to get ahead of it. Um, we have a couple minutes left, and I want to give kind of you kind of one last question, and it's, and it's a basic one, which is we, we're fortunate to have a good amount of people watching this right now, many who will watch this after. If the folks watching who are watching now and who will watch this in the future, if they remember one thing that you say, what is that? What is the one thing you want them to walk away from this conversation with? Yeah. You know, I would say that if you know anybody that works in healthcare, thank them. And, and then take that extra step to intentionally think about how we can generate interest in the healthcare setting among our nation's youth. We have got to do our part to help attract people into this profession. To your earlier point, Chike, there are so many opportunities to serve in healthcare, whether it's a clinical role or a non-clinical role. But this is truly about the infrastructure of our nation. Uh, you have nothing when you don't have health. And as a country, we have to acknowledge that this workforce challenge and also crisis is very real. And we all have to do our part to help attract people into it and we also have to do our part, to your point, to reach populations that have not normally been there uh, or been represented. And so we need to be very intentional about that as well. There is no space better to serve than in healthcare, but we have to give people that opportunity. And I do firmly believe, to your point, apprenticeships, uh, youth career pathways, programs like that are, are so powerful because it's truly what can give people that opportunity. I'll tell you quickly a story uh, of a young girl in South Carolina that we met in providing a free mammogram to her mother. Uh, her family has only ever worked in factories. And after she had this experience of seeing the Siemens technology, meeting the care team, learning about the different roles, she said to her mom after the screening, mom, does this mean I don't have to work in that factory? This is why this work is so important. And so I'm so glad to you know, have been here with you to, to share it. No, I first of all, Jeffrey, thank you so much. And to the president of the workforce at Harvard, to my colleagues, thank you so much for hosting this. But I'll, I'll go, I'll end with what Jeffrey did, which is if, you, if we don't have health, we don't have anything. Uh, and in the end, if we don't have the people to populate that system that takes care of each of us, or we're going to take care of each of us at some point in the future, uh, we and we at we as a country are not going to be the country that we want to be. If you're if if I can leave anyone with this, uh, like Jeffrey and I we were lucky to be in the UK about two months ago and uh, meet the heads of workforce for the National Health Service in in the UK, and it, and they're having the same challenges that we are. But what I can mention, and partially because of their system, but they have said, we are going to take this as an enterprise challenge. We are going to treat our talent like a supply chain, and we are going to create a system. We're not going to depend on each hospital to figure it out themselves. We're not each community to figure it out themselves. We're going to take this as a, as a country and as, a, as communities. We're going to take this on, and we're going to create a system to solve this. This will not be solved sporadically. This will be solved with systems. And I think of the people who are going to be watching this, who are watching this now, not just how do we for all of our healthy professions, thank them when they do amazing work for us like we did during the pandemic. But how do we actually thank them systemically by creating systems that are gonna help them stay in the roles, get in the roles, and hopefully create a path for the folks who are gonna come behind them, who are gonna take care of all of us. Um, but with that, I wish you all a wonderful day. Jeffrey, thank you so much to my colleagues again at the project. Uh, thank you for, for hosting this time. And, we, and, and we'll and we all hopefully see you soon. Thank you.